So thank you very much for coming. <laughs> So uh, we'll see how much I can uh, convey to you guys in the three lectures that I uh, have here. Um, but it's nice to be here. Thanks to Pierre to, for inviting me and for organizing this uh, winter school, which hopefully you guys are learning something from. And it's nice to finally be out here at the Biosphere Institute, which Pierre has told me so much about. Let me see if I did. Uh, since I wasn't here for all the other lectures, I'm suspecting that you're going to find some overlap between things that I want to say and things that other people have said. So that's a fine time to raise your hand and say, you know, we're kind of sick of this. Could you move on to the next thing? Uh, I will, I will. Uh, okay, so this is what I would want to cover um, if, uh, if time permits. And uh, this, the discussion is going to have a, a focus on uh, atomic physics. Um, and I'll try to, uh, uh, I guess in, in today's lecture, uh, show you how you can come up with uh, real numbers from pretty simple sort of ad initio time type of approaches for describing real uh, experimental systems, such as the ones that we have in my laboratory. Um, the topic of uh, cavity QED, I think, has been covered at uh, sort of a theoretical level uh, in some of the previous lectures. So my intention here is to uh, show you how to put numbers in behind the symbols. But then what I want to do is show you a way in which one goes from this idea of cavity quantum electrodynamics to cavity optomechanics. So that's now thinking about these high finesse reservoirs, or thinking about electromagnetic resonators and how they interact not with just the internal degrees of freedom of an object of a few level system, but also with the external center of mass degrees of freedom. And uh, I'll show you uh, what uh, you know, maybe through like the lectures of Osh Clerk, you've seen sort of a uh, solid state approach uh, toward optomechanics, and I'll show you sort of an alternate way of getting towards thinking about optomechanics from the viewpoint of atomic physics. And we'll build it up from single atoms eventually to many atoms, and then I'll sort of distill it eventually to things that uh, I guess have more to do with things that I've been doing in my laboratory. Although I'll hope not to be totally unfair to my uh, competitors in the field. Um, and I'll refer you to these uh, uh, texts for more information. Uh, a lot of what I'm telling you is uh, summarized in a review paper that I, I had the displeasure of writing. Uh, it's on the archive now, which gives me great pleasure. And uh, I'll drop some references on the as well. Okay, so we'll do the first one. So let's think about how cavity QED systems are actually uh, made. So I think you've already you've already had an introduction to what cavity. Can people see that from over there? Do we need the lights? We can right right. There is a switch. And this switch back here. It's it's right back to There's the black. So it's this one here. Okay. What about this one? This one is good. So, um, I guess you had uh, theoretical introductions to cavity QED. And the ingredients in a cavity QED system are, uh, first of all, an electromagnetic resonator. And the idea with the electromagnetic resonator <coughs> is to give you um, a system with a, a single electromagnetic mode and a finite volume, as opposed to just photons propagating in free space where we let the boundaries go off to infinity. And then there'll be some uh, coupling to the outside world. So the outside world is going to present a uh, continuous spectrum of radiation, although maybe just in one dimension, the one dimension heading into the resonator. But it's going to have a continuous uh, spectrum. We'll have propagating modes. And they'll be connected to this uh, single mode cavity. And you know, all systems are only going to be approximations to this kind of uh, scheme. But we'll, show, we'll see how some of those approximations come about. 
And then finally, the second ingredient is to come up with a two-level system. And uh, you want this uh, two-level system in the uh, in at least the James Cummings model. You want this uh, two-level system to have a dipole moment. And uh, you want it to be spatially fixed. That is, uh, when you have uh, expressions for the cavity QED Hamiltonian, or the James Cummings Hamiltonian, you have a coupling strength which is just given to you. Uh, and you don't, at least at first blush, want to play with the fact that that coupling strength depends also on environmental conditions, one of them being the position of an object. Uh, in the case of something like a transmon qubit, which uh, Gervin told you about, you don't have to worry about that too much. It's just wired into your circuit. When you worry, worry about the things that I worry about, you know, rubidium atoms that are hardly trapped at all in their containers, then you worry about this uh, consideration quite a bit. Uh, and in fact, uh, the whole pursuit of cavity optomechanics in cold atoms was initiated by the desire to not have cavity optomechanics, to have atoms that are completely fixed in space, because one wanted to do things like use the James Cumming model or the cavity QED system to just do quantum information science and not do, and not complicate it with the fact that things are moving. Anyhow, so these are the ingredients for a, uh, for a good cavity QED system, uh, which would obey this James, Cum James Cummings model, which you've, uh, I think, been presented to you with. Now let me, uh, instead of describing that thing with too much theory, uh, try to give you some uh, experimental reference to how such systems are constructed. Um, there are by now very many types of resonators that are used for cavity QED. So, for example, uh, uh, John Teufel gave you a presentation uh, yesterday where he discussed uh, LC resonators that he fabricates with, uh, you know, drum head capacitors and big serpentine inductors that are hooked up just like things you would buy out of an electronics catalog. Um, another variant on that is the uh, superconducting strip line resonator. And these are uh, very fun resonators to uh, play with, I hear. And the idea with these strip line resonators is that they, uh, they basically look like a, a coaxial circuit, a coaxial cable that somebody stomped on. So if you view one of these strip lines from the top, you see uh, some superconducting material, you see a gap, you see some more superconducting material, you see another gap, and then you see more of the stuff. Okay. So these uh, outside regions, they act like the grounding shield of your, uh, say, BNC cable. And this middle strip is the live wire, which uh, can carry a variable voltage. Uh, how is this wire sort of suspended in free space? Well, the way these things are typically fabricated is they take uh, like uh, some insulating substrate, like silicon maybe or germanium and they uh, plate it with uh, a superconductor. So this is typically either aluminum or niobium. <clears throat> and then they go ahead and they do some etching and they uh, cut this thing down like this. That's it. Okay, so this would be like a side view where this is the top view and you have this superconducting strip which is connected to an insulator um, but but so it's that, that's the way in which it's suspended. And the dimensions here are that these thicknesses are uh, submicron, maybe 200 nanometers or so, and all these other dimensions are sort of in the one to five micron range or so. Uh, so they're fairly standard objects to, uh, to fabricate. Uh, how do they end up being uh, resonators? So if I... Uh, if I think about a length of this uh, superconducting strip, I'll realize that it has a, uh, a capacitance per unit length. Why? Because if I uh, place a differential voltage here, I have charge, let's say, on this inner lead versus the ground planes, that generates an electric field. 
and from uh, considering the voltage that you get now uh, as a function of the charge on these objects, or considering how much energy is stored in the electric field, you build up a capacitance. And since the volume which, com which contains the electric field grows with length, then you have a capacitance per unit length. You also have uh, an inductance per unit length. The inductance comes about, as you know, from the fact that if you have currents running up and down this uh, center cable, uh, it generates magnetic fields. I guess magnetic fields might wrap around like that. And the magnetic fields then also carry energy, and the energy stored in those magnetic fields defines the inductance. And that inductance also grows per unit length. In addition, in superconductors, there's another kind of inductance, which is the kinetic inductance. This has to do with the fact that uh, supercurrents are formed from the non-dissipative flow of Cooper pairs. And Cooper pairs have mass. So if you want to slow down a current, you have to take out that kinetic energy. That's like just like getting rid of the magnetic energy when you try to slow down the, the current in a solenoid. So superconductors have both magnetic inductance and kinetic inductance, this adds up to a certain amount of conductance per unit length. Uh, superconductors also have resistance. Why? Because they're not at zero temperature. And when you have non-zero temperature, you have uh, thermal, non-condensed, I suppose, excitations around. And these things can, uh, can give you regular uh, resistance. So there's also a resistance per unit length to this uh, cable. All in all, these uh, objects per unit length, they define a uh, characteristic impedance, which is going to be the resistance per unit length. Here's the inductance. Here's the capacitance per unit length. And this thing is uh, almost real. Except for this resistance, it would be a real quantity. It has the units of ohms, like a resistor. And uh, try what you will, and when you're designing a, uh, uh, a cable, uh, sorry, a coaxial cable, a strip line resonator, you're going to get inductances which are on the order of 50 ohms or so. Yeah. Why is there a square root? Then? Why is there a square root in that inductance? And then the, the so the Z is the is the characteristic impedance. inductance. Yeah, the impedance. So why is the square root over the? Oh, okay. I'll So it just, it just seems like if there was no capacitance and no inductance, Z should equal R. And you've got it equaling root R over naught. Um. Yeah, of course. John? Oh, I mean, I would say you should think of the limit uh, where R is zero, and you just have inductance so always compensating capacitance. And then you get a characteristic impedance that's like their geometric means. So <clears throat> the impedance of the inductor is I omega L, the impedance of the capacitor is 1 over I omega C. So I would expect the impedance of general LCR system to be R plus some either, it's either I omega L plus 1 over I omega C or I omega C plus 1 over whichever one the units are correct for, I can't remember. So the units are going to be correct because right, the bottom part has units yeah. of. Um, yeah, no, I can see it. Yeah, so the sorry. units are correct, but yes, why does resistance come in so, that way? But it'll be because there's a, an assumption somewhere that, yeah. um, that, that an approximation is something in the limit of something, but I just wondered what the approximation was. The approximation is that this, I guess, acts dominantly like a transmission line. That uh, the impedances are dominantly, that's mostly reactants. That's true. It's like mostly L and C and not much R. Cool. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, so this is going to be on the order, this is going to be something like 50 ohms. And then it's also going to be a little bit uh, non real, right? So it has a little e to the minus i delta. <coughs> this delta here is something known as a loss tangent. <coughs> it tells you how small this resistance is compared to the other stuff that's around. The uh, quality factor of a up superconducting circuit uh, is related to this uh, loss tangent basically by the relation that delta is 1 over q. And it's something like 10 to the minus 5. Okay. 
Okay, so that tells you what kind of quality factors you'll get for uh, resonators made of strip lines. And then how do you build a resonator out of this kind of stuff? Well, it's pretty cute. So let me, uh, let me try to draw the uh, superconductor material. So here's a chunk of the superconductor. This is the top view again. Here's another chunk of superconductor. And it sort of meanders around like your intestines. And then finally, it comes out the other end, like your intestines. And um, here's a gap. So this is all sort of missing material. And the rest of this is also super Okay. So what do we have here? We have an input and output channel. <clears throat> where you can send uh, plane waves into, or you can send the, this continuous electromagnetic spectrum into your resonator. Here's one form of boundary condition. It's an open boundary condition. Here's a grounded boundary condition. Uh, the boundary conditions have significance for whether there's uh, current or not flowing through these uh, boundaries. If you make the total length of this serpentine thing uh, equal lambda over 4, that defines the wavelength of the radiation that resonates here, and thereby also defines for you when you think about the uh, characteristic impedance, uh, will tell you what the uh, what the frequency of this thing is. And it'll have a frequency of 10 to 100 gigahertz. Okay, so this is like the solid state version of uh, one of these cavities that's used for things like cavity QED, also used for cavity optomechanics, which is why I wanted to present it. Here's another kind of resonator. Here's an optical one, which is the microtoroid, toroid, which is used both for experiments in cavity optomechanics and in cavity QED. So what do these things look like? If you look at them on top, they look like this. And if you look at them from the side, you see the following. You see that there's a layer of uh, silicon dioxide, which is all rough because it's been etched with real etchers. And it sits on top of uh, silicon, which is also combined in the substrate. And when you fabricate this thing, it's a not impressive resonator. And then uh, the guys figured out that what you can do now is you can shine uh, a big pulse of CO2 light on this, sorry, of a CO2 laser, which is 10 micron light. And focus down a few megawatts per square meter, so uh, a lot of power. And you just focus it down on this, uh, on this migratory for maybe 100 milliseconds. And what happens is that the silicon dioxide here is more absorptive than the silicon at this wavelength. And also, silicon is a really good thermal conductor, whereas silicon dioxide is an insulator. So the silicon dioxide gets really hot, the silicon doesn't get really hot. Now what happens is essentially that this disk of stuff that you made melts, right there sitting on the top of this mushroom. And it melts, and then surface tension just naturally causes it to develop really smooth surfaces. And to beat up so that after this 100 milliseconds, your microtoid looks very smooth and lovely sort of this cross-sectional shape, where <coughs> this size is, I don't know, uh, maybe five microns or so, and this dimension here, which defines the diameter of your toroid, is going to be tens of microns. And this turn thing turns out to be a lovely uh, electromagnetic resonator now. Um, the electromagnetic modes that propagate in this toroid are what are known as whispering gallery modes. They're modes that are trapped by the fact that they're sort of internally reflecting on these uh, surfaces of the glass. So the light is essentially inside the glass, and it's sort of bouncing along and uh, reflecting off of the surface of this, uh, of this curved thing. It's also confined vertically by the fact that the uh, microtory has this round shape in the other dimension as well. So if you now looked at what the electromagnetic mode density looks like, 
It's uh, sort of very uh, dense here at the edge of the microtoroid with typical dimensions where <coughs> this is like one to two microns. This is you know, maybe an aspect ratio of three or four. And a little bit of this light, as you get in total internal reflection, uh, escapes the edge of the microtoroid into vacuum, but it's an evanescent field, right? Because it's not uh, matched to propagate into vacuum. So there's a little bit of electromagnetic energy that leaks out and falls off rapidly with strength. The field falls off like uh, e to the minus k times the radius. <clears throat> so right up against the very edge of the microtory, there's a lot of electromagnetic uh, field. There's high intensity, or sort of strong electromagnetic power density. But it falls off pretty rapidly as you go up. OK. And these things are, are quite nice. They uh, achieve quality factors of around 10 to the 8 or so these days. They're limited by uh, residual absorption in the glass. Sometimes you get water that absorbs on the surface, which spoils the property of the, of the disc. Uh, internally in the glass, you have defects that have various characteristics, and that kind of limits uh, the quality factor. And you typically work with maybe the 200th or so mode in this resonator. That is, uh, at the wavelength of interest, the entire circumference is maybe something like <coughs> times the wavelength. So that's a typical value for microtorrents. How do you drive these uh, cavities in the earth? Great. So to drive this cavity, thanks for asking. <clears throat> you come up with a, uh, a tapered optical fiber. So here's a thick fiber. And what they do is they get regular fiber from the vendor. And they put it over a flame. And they pull. And uh, right over the flame, the, the, gas, the glass is pretty soft, so it stretches and stretches very, very smoothly. If you pull too far, of course, it just breaks. But if you pull it just right, you can get it so you end up with a very smooth uh, taper. Again, the sort of curvature of this thing is just guaranteed by surface tension. And the idea is that the electromagnetic mode that propagates along here also has a fair bit of uh, intensity outside of the uh, fiber. In fact, there's sort of a transition region where the mode goes predominantly from being within the fiber to outside the fiber. <clears throat> and so you have a little bit of sort of an evanescent coupling between these two. Okay. And now this starts looking kind of like that. And the length of the cavity, well, the, okay, so the diameter is uh, 50 microns, so that it's going to be about 50 microns, right? But they, you know, you can vary the size, or they can vary the size. I can't do anything. How much tapering do they put in these fibers? Is it, is it probably not as much as you drew here? Oh, it's not, well, it's not at all drawn to scale. So it's really kind of over a long length. You go from, but you, and you reduce the radius by a factor of two or something like that, do you know? Um, it's something like six centimeters. No, I think of, it's just a few microns. It's something like six centimeters of pull. Right. So the tapered region is something like six centimeters. And the, uh, the thinnest region is probably two microns wide. Two or three yeah, microns. Yeah, so you go from having like a hundred micron or so yeah. core down to like two. Oh, wow. So yeah. it's really cool. Uh, it's really fragile. Yeah. Right. But and it's much stronger than what you think what it's like. Well, you know. I'm sorry? You look like in transmission or reflection. You see the modes going tum, 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 and then finally you're at the last mode okay. in the fiber. Like you can see all the transverse modes then. They all die. I see. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So those are my words. <coughs> and this was all just to be fair to other people. Now we'll go to the real stuff. <laughs> which is the good old uh, Fabio Perot optical resonator. Gaussian beams. 
you pick up a catalog from an optics company and you look in some of the first pages. They seem to have the best uh, textbook descriptions of Gaussian optics. Okay, so a focused Gaussian beam, uh, you know, looks kind of like this. Here I'm drawing the lines where the intensity falls to uh, 1 over e squared of its value in the, along the axis. And if you focus down a Gaussian beam, you think about the uh, wave fronts in this beam. Far away from the focus, the wave fronts are just uh, spherical, right, converging down on these points. At the very center of the beam, the wave front is flat. And so it kind of spans the range between them. So you see as a function of uh, distance from the center, the wave fronts become ever more curved. Now you think about taking two uh, well-polished, rather reflective curved mirrors, and you face them, you have them facing each other. You think, what, uh, what mode do they support? What electromagnetic mode do they support? They support the mode where, at the spacing between these mirrors, the wave front is curved just along the surface of the mirror. So imagine if I had mirrors that exactly match the curvature here, and uh, up here, then by definition, the, the, the first order, the, I guess the TEM00 mode that they support is exactly the one that I've drawn here. Okay. And uh, you can look up some uh, formulas. It turns out that if I think about these lines of constant phase, they have a radius of curvature, which is a function of distance from the uh, center of the focus, and that thing goes like 1 over z times z squared plus z naught squared. So at 0, the radius of curvature is infinite, right, because it's just a sheet, it's not curved at all. And as you move off, uh, it becomes ever more curved. And this z naught squared, this z naught here defines a length scale. This is the Rayleigh range. defined as phi w naught squared over lambda, <coughs> where w naught is this uh, radius. So you have to think a little bit self-consistently. There's a certain uh, beam waste that you'll create given mirrors of a certain curvature at a certain distance from one another. Let me give you an example, just so you know that we're not cheating when we write uh, numbers in our papers. <laughs> Um, let's say I went to the store and I bought myself mirrors that had a radius of curvature of 5 centimeters. And they were polished really well and coated with these dielectric layers, typically alternating layers of silicon dioxide and tantalum oxide, so that they reflect light at the wavelength that I'm concerned about. They reflect it really well. And let's say I figure out how to space them by uh, 250 microns. Uh, what mode do they support? So I would plug things in here. Here's uh, five centimeters. The distance to each of the mirrors would be, let's say, L over two, right? Because each of them are half that far away from the center. And given that, I can back out what the uh, Rayleigh range is. So it's two and a half millimeters, or so. And then, um, given that Rayleigh range, I can figure out what the width of the mode is, and I do all that, and I find that uh, at a wavelength of 780 nanometers, which is where my experiments are going to take place, I end up with a beam waste of 25 microns. All right, so no voodoo. We actually knew ahead of time what size the beam was going to be, and that's uh, how we solved for it. Now, what's the, uh, what's the mode function? inside of this fabric for a resonator. It's going to be a little easier for me to write that down than to write the things down for, let's say, a microtore, which is a little bit complicated. So that mode function is simply 
uh, that of the Gaussian wave, the focused Gaussian beam. Except, of course, I have now uh, light propagating in both directions. So it's a, a standing wave pattern of light inside of that cavity. And I look up in the textbook, I find that uh, the electric field inside of my mode is some value because I can afford to multiply it by this is just a normalizer. We'll pay attention to that later. And I have the following. solving uh, Gaussian optics, I get this particular expression. Uh, this here describes the fact that the width of my uh, mode increases as I move away from the center. But in the case that I have here where the Rayleigh range is uh, two and a half millimeters, but the length of the cavity is only a quarter of a millimeter, I can neglect that. So let me uh, just neglect this factor and uh, just set this thing to omega zero. And I can also then neglect this factor and this factor when I'm doing calculations. Because none of them are relevant for these near planar cavities that I have in my experiment. Okay, so what the mode uh, looks like, um, well, okay, what the mode looks like then is, uh, so the electromagnetic field has these long regions where the field is, let's say, positive, and then over here it's negative, positive. So here in this radial direction, the transverse direction to the, uh, to the cavity axis, the field extends out to 10, 20 microns in my case. Um, but it alternates in magnet sign over a distance of half a wavelength, which is about 400 nanometers. So it varies very rapidly along this direction, varies very weakly along the radial direction. What's the uh, resonance condition inside of this resonator? Um, well, you know that you get uh, resonances roughly whenever the uh, wave vector of the light times the length of the resonator is some integer number times pi. And this is roughly true. It's not true insofar as my mirrors aren't metallic. So the, uh, the wave doesn't, doesn't just, uh, the, so the electric field doesn't just strictly go to zero at the surface of the mirror, and then it's zero inside of the metal substrate, let's say. It actually uh, penetrates into the mirror coatings. And so there's a phase shift on reflection that, uh, something that's kind of hard to calculate has to do with the properties of the mirrors. It depends a lot on wavelength. But anyhow, roughly this is going to define the resonance condition. Modulo of some small phase they have to add. Okay, that means that the uh, resonance spectrum of my Krabby Creole cavity is going to be a bunch of uh, sharp lines. And the lines are going to be divided by uh, frequency, which is uh, C over twice the length. And this thing defines the free spectral range of the cavity. So let's put in uh, some numbers for the cavity that I just drew for you. Uh, this is the speed of light, so that's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And here's the length, that's uh, 250 microns. And I work this out, and this is about 600 meters. So they're pretty far spaced from one another. Uh, certainly, I can tune a laser to hit one of the resonances and not the other one of the resonances. OK, now what about uh, things like losses and the finite uh, line width of my resonator? OK, so I have these two mirrors, should have noticed them. And uh, each of them is imperfect. It has a bit of uh, 
uh, transmission that is some amount of the light bouncing through here doesn't just reflect, a little bit of it escapes. And the power that escapes on each, each time that we strike the mirror, that'll be some small number t. And then it's also true that some of the light just uh, is neither reflected nor transmitted. It's just kind of absorbed. Or maybe it's scattered in some awful direction. Or maybe it's diffraction off of the edges of the mirror because I didn't bother to make a really big mirror. Or for some reason, I had to uh, shave it down to make it small. Okay. So given the uh, transmission of each mirror and the loss of each mirror, uh, I can define the finesse. The finesse is 2 pi divided by all these losses. And I also uh, can obtain the capital line width. So usually you write down the half line width for some reason. And this half line width is, uh, let's see, it's, it's, uh, it's got sort of various factors of the half. It's got a 2 pi because I have to go from uh, cyclical to angular units. And then I have my free spectral range divided by the finesse. Anyhow, it's also defined by all of these losses. And let me give you uh, a real life example. So uh, I have these two mirrors. And uh, when I built the cavity, I wanted to make sure that most of the light would escape from one of the mirrors and not from the other. But unfortunately, I had bought two mirrors, which both had really great reflectivity, very low transmission. What was I to do? Well, I handed it over to my grad student. And he dips it in an acid, and then in another acid, and then back in the first acid, then back in the other acid, back and forth, peels off a bunch of these dielectric layers, and now we have a more transmissive mirror. Great idea. OK, so now uh, one of them has a transmission of 1.5 parts per million. The other one has a transmission of maybe 12 parts.